with us. Yes, Let's give them a, a big, of warm, solid ground welcome. I think we can do a little bit better than that, oh, to be honest. Oh, totally. That's more like it. We not only um, are pastors together, but we are close, close friends. In fact, you guys are our closest friends in this country, in this world, in this <laughs> universe. Um, God has placed you in our lives uh, for this season. Yes. And uh, it's a great privilege to have you guys here this morning. Brian, yes. thank you for coming to minister to us. And we're looking forward to all that God is going to share through you this morning. But before we do, we'd love to hear from Caitlin. Just tell us something, Caitlin. Sure. <laughs> Hello, Solid Ground Church. It's really, really such a privilege uh, for me especially to be here today with um, our elders and uh, some of our leaders. You know, Brian's the lucky one in the family because he's come here a number of times and he's lived under the, the joy and the blessing of connecting into your community. And I am just so grateful to be here. Uh, Psalm 133 speaks about how uh, pleasant and good it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. And it is pleasant and it is good to be with you, solid ground. It is pleasant and it is good to know you. And it is pleasant and good to receive from the gift of what God is doing in this community. Amazing. For many of us, we are familiar strangers. But we at West Point, in Natal, in Durban, we benefit from the gift of faith that God has put thank into God. this church. Wow. So thank you. Thank you for your yes to Jesus. Thank you for following him. Um, thank you for sowing into his kingdom. It is pleasant and good for us because of the unity yeah. we enjoy with you. Amazing. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. Well, Brian, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for Brian and Caitlin, and I pray that as Brian preaches to us right now, Lord, that you would empower him with the Holy Spirit to preach with boldness, Lord, and we open up our hearts to receive right now in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning, solid ground. It is such, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> it is so good to be here with you, uh, not just this morning, but this whole weekend. Um, and the relationship between our two, two churches brings me personally so much joy. And I know that the Father sm smiles down upon us as we gather in unity, as we, as we worship together, as we celebrate together. And so I want to encourage you, if you're able, we've got some kind of limited spaces. I'm not sure exactly how James is going to work it out. But if you want to come and experience um, some fun and joy and celebration and the beach and lots of humidity, get on this trip down to West Point. We would love to welcome you in uh, Durban with us. So, um, yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you for being so hospit hospitable and uh, welcoming. This is really such a joy. I don't feel like I need to do too much of an intro about like me and my family and my life story because I really do feel so at home here at Solid Ground. And uh, so thank you for making it a place where uh, when I come and visit, it's just like, oh, cool. Hey, guys. Hey, Renes. Hey, Jono, Benika. How's it going? It's just like my family. And um, I just want to thank you for being such a warm, welcoming church. And so I feel really at home. I've got uh, my wife, Caitlin, who you've just heard from. She's the real gift in the family. But we've got two little boys, uh, Judah and Caleb. Judah is six. Caleb is three. And uh, they've had the best time uh, hanging out with your leaders and their kids and going to the birds of prey thing and just having the most amazing time. And uh, Judah's probably busy having the time of his life in your children's church. So we're going to go home and we're going to have to spend like a lot of money making sure our children's church has an awesome play park. And uh, so thanks for that. And if you want to contribute, you can just give uh, directly into my... No, I'm joking. So our family is the four of us, but there are another two important members of our family. We have uh, Lucy, who's a Cocker Spaniel. She's an amazing, easy dog, very pleasant. But then we have this other dog. Her name is Shelby. Now, let me, I think there should be a photo coming up about, of Shelby. Shelby is a Bernese mountain dog. Is it up? Is it there? Look at Shelby. That's Shelby at uh, seven months old. So that's, uh, she's not fully grown. And uh, Shelby is this beautiful, Instagram-worthy, like kind of amazing dog. She's you can cuddle her. Her fur is so soft. It dries like so quickly. She's just an amazing, beautiful, lovely, 
you look at this dog, and you're like, we need a dog like that. And, and, and she's the, but let me tell you, she is the worst decision I've ever made in my life. This dog has cost me unbelievable amounts of money. She has dug, in in our, dug up in our garden the cable that runs from the intercom and the power source to the driveway gate. She's dug that up three times and eaten, not chewed, eaten, swallowed, and pooped out the cable that runs to the gate. This is one thing. This dog swallows entire dish towels without chewing, just swallows them and then you find them in different areas of the garden. Uh, oftentimes we're like, I can't find this one sock, only to later find that sock in the garden in a pile, um, underpants, you name it. <laughs> Shoes, jackets, this dog is mad. But, um, and there's been a number of times, in fact, I actually tried to get the Lennoxes to take uh, Shelby at one point, and uh, that's no word of a lie. Um, in fact, there should be another photo. Um, that's James uh, cuddling Shelby in our house. Uh, look, uh, you're, you're amazing. Uh, but here's the thing. My son Judah and Shelby have this amazing bond. Uh, he, she, she lies on top of him, cuddles him. Uh, we, when we're putting the kids down, nine times out of ten, Shelby has realized it's bedtime for the boys, and she gets into the boys' room, and she's hiding under their bed, and we just see this like massive tail like swashing under the bed. Uh, she just wants to be with Judah all the time. And from the moment we got Shelby, Judah had this overwhelming love towards her. He's an amazing, compassionate kid, and he just loves Shelby so much. And it's out of this place of how much he loves her, she just wants to be with him all the time, which, co which contributes to a lot of the destruction that we encounter in our home. Because uh, if Shelby's outside, she's so desperate to be with him, she, we've often found like paw prints uh, through the windows because she's made her way through a window or she's trying to tear down the front door. James was at our house last week and uh, he said to me, your front door's not looking good. It's because Shelby just wants to be with Judah all the time. She, she's desperate to be in his presence. And uh, what I came to realize is that actually she loves him so much. But you know what the thing is? Is that, she, that he loved her first. And from a place of, of knowing that how much he loves her and that she can do no wrong in his eyes, she is just so desperate to encounter him and his presence and his love. And is just, she just wants to be close to him all the time. He loved her first. And as a result of that, she's desperate to be with him. Friends, I want to ask you this morning, do you know how much God loves you? And do you know that he loved you first? He loves you first. There is no wrong you can do in his eyes. There is no destruction or chaos you can cause that would make him love you any less. He does not view you like I view Shelby, but he views you like Judah views Shelby. There is no wrong she can do. And as a result of that, Shelby just wants to be in his presence. He loved her first, and she just wants to be with him. 1 John 4 says, we love because he first loved us. In John 15, we read, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything I've heard my father doing. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Before we made a decision to get up and come to church or surrender our lives to Jesus, he chose us and he loves us. Ephesians 1 says, For he chooses us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. And so today is a great day because we are starting our first uh, message in our combined preaching series that we've titled en Encountering Jesus. And this is a, at West Point Church. We kick this off next week. And it's saying a solid ground in West Point Church. We're going to do something together. And we're going to do the thing that we do together is going to be centered around Jesus. And our heart, our desire is that we would encounter him together. That we would have a tangible experience of encountering the person of Jesus. And that's what we're doing between our two churches. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at prayer and reading the scriptures and worship. And how do we encounter Jesus in our everyday lives? And the idea and the goal behind these four weeks is that we would cultivate within ourselves, within our communities, a deeper desire for us to want to be with Jesus. That we would just be so desperate to get into his presence because he loves us so much and I want to experience his love. I want to encounter his love. I want us to be awakened, friends, to the beauty and wonder of Christ. And I want us to learn together how we can better encounter Jesus in everyday stuff.
And so our desire to be with Jesus, to encounter him, it's motivated by just how much he loves us. I have a revelation of how much I am loved. I just want to be in that place. Because if our motivation to encounter Jesus or be with him is motivated by anything other than his love towards us or experiencing his love, then we're basically starting off in the wrong point. It won't last. We won't have a true encounter. It just it won't be sustainable. We are motivated by love, in particular his love towards us. And so today, I want to look at how we can encounter Jesus when we pray. Now, when we talk about prayer, particularly on a Sunday in the church, uh, different emotions can arise within us. Uh, for many of us, it could be this emotion of guilt, like, oh my gosh, I don't pray enough, and this feels like now you're telling me I must do something that I know I'm not doing enough, and so I feel guilty. For some of us, it might be fear that someone might ask us to pray aloud, like that's a, that's a real stressful thing. Or, or for some of us, it might be a desire like, I know prayer is important. I know prayer is awesome. I know that when I pray, I encounter Jesus. I want to do this. I just don't know how. And for some of us, it might be, oh, prayer again, like so boring. Now, personally, I've experienced all of these emotions when it comes to prayer. I remember uh, one or many multiple evenings Early on in our marriage, when Caitlin and I would drive off to community group on a Wednesday evening, and I would tell Caitlin, under no uncertain terms, would, would, uh, would I pray aloud? And that if I was asked during community group to pray aloud, like, Brian, won't you open in prayer? That she better perform her biblical wifely duties and step in and cover in prayer for me. I remember feeling guilt uh, in seasons gone by that I just don't pray enough. Uh, I have definitely felt the desire to get better at prayer and get better at my relationship with Jesus, knowing that actually to have a relationship with him, like I need to pray and I need to get better at prayer, only to find that every time I pray, I just find that I'm asking him for stuff, that it's just my shopping list towards the sky. And I know that for me personally, to be in a relationship where the only time we engage and particularly if I'm on the receiving end of that relationship, is if I'm getting requests for things, then that relationship would probably suck. Like imagine every time I spoke to Caitlin, the only time I ever verbally spoke to her was when I asked her to do stuff for me. The relationship would be deficient. And I felt, um, you know, that as a result of a disconnected heart towards the Lord or disordered loves in my life, that prayer can be boring. By the way, when prayer is boring, it probably reflects more of my own heart than it does reflect on God himself. So here's the thing. In my prayer life, when I reflect back on it and these emotions and these seasons of ups and downs, I find that more often than not, I was probably starting off in the wrong place. I was starting with me. You know, I wanted to get something out of prayer. I wanted to get better at prayer. I wanted my prayers to be answered. I, I wanted prayer for me. But prayer, friends, is not about me and it's not for me. Prayer is also not something that I have to do. It's not a command like you have to pray. Friends, we need to shape our minds around a new way of thinking about prayer. Prayer is not something you have to do. Prayer is something we get to do. The Heavenly Father invites us into a relationship with Him. We get to pray. We get to have a relationship with Him. And so we know prayer is important, and we also know that prayer is oftentimes a neglected thing within the life of the Christian church, and we know that, uh, that we need to get better at prayer. Corey Russell, in his book on prayer, fantastic book, he highlights just the state of prayer in the global church, and I, I quote him, he says this, our, our church buildings are growing larger, but our impact on culture is growing smaller. Our children and teens are growing up in what many are beginning to call a post-Christian society, and we are losing the war for their souls. Why is this? We have neglected the place of prayer in our personal lives and ministries. The power of the Holy Spirit has been replaced with marketing strategies and conferences, which provide false growth and masks our true barrenness. In the face of the rising tide of godlessness, we have tried everything but the one thing that is necessary, prayer. And when I read that, many in the room would agree with me. 
that actually the one thing that is necessary is prayer. But it's oftentimes the one thing that we don't end up doing. Friends, prayer is so important. And I know that all of us know this. I know that we would all agree, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've read the scriptures, you're like, we know prayer is a thing. Like it's an important thing. In fact, the disciples themselves, the 12 dudes that walked around and witnessed Jesus' life and ministry, the only thing they asked Jesus to teach them is teach us to pray in Luke chapter 11. Charles Spurgeon, who we know as the Prince of Preachers, he is once famously quoted in saying that he would rather teach one person to pray than 10 men to, to preach. Prayer, friends, is the secret to unlocking the kingdom of heaven in our lives, in our communities, in our church. If we want to see the kingdom come in Middleburg as it is in heaven, I see this around here, it's through the quiet, intimate place of prayer in our own lives, prayer in our corporate gatherings to see the kingdom of God come. So what is prayer? At its core, prayer is simply speaking to God. It's just us talking to God. Prayer is living in an awareness that we are walking under the open ear of heaven. Like God's ear is pointed towards us and he's waiting to hear from us. It's like me with my kids. They come home from school and I just want to know all about their day. I don't want to know it's fine or it was good. I want to know the details and the intricacies of what was good, what was bad, what did you learn. I, as a dad, I want to hear from my kids. And when they speak, I'm listening. I'm all ears. I'm not distracted. I want to hear from them. It's the same with God. We are walking under the open ear of heaven, friends. His ear is available to us. And when we tell things, when we tell our things to God, when we converse with Him, and we are confident in the fact that He is listening to us, everything changes with prayer. It's not a duty or a ritual or a liturgy that we perform it's a relationship that we engage in. And then we start to see that we ourselves and our hearts are drawn into intimacy with the Father. We get ourselves protected from pride. We are spurred on to greater levels of holiness. We find ourselves being anointed with power. We, we united with the body of Christ, being able to minister and engage and build relationship with people that are different to us. We get trained to become rulers in the kingdom. We participate with God in his kingdom rule and the advancement of his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. It starts in prayer. And most importantly, most importantly, we encounter Jesus. So many of us want an encounter with Jesus and we try so many fancy things. Friends, we just need to pray. Isaiah 56 verse 7 says, I, and, and this is the prophet prophesying about what the Lord will do. And he says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem. So he's saying, I'm going to take the people of God. And I'm going to put them in one place. I'm going to bring them together. And they will find joy. Who wants joy in their life? Life has been so hard recently. I want joy and peace and life experienced in my emotions. And God says, I will fill the believers with joy in my house of prayer. He's saying, come together, pray, and you will experience joy. And he goes on to say, because my temple, my, the place where my people gather, the church, we will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isaiah prophesied of a day when the Lord will bring the people of God together and into the reality of an encounter with Jesus through prayer, and he will make us joyful in that place. Prayer shouldn't be something that weighs heavy on us, like I'm, it's such a hard thing to do. It's actually, I find joy when I come into the Father's presence. What I find so fascinating, though, is in this verse, God calls his house a his church is, is built a house of prayer. He doesn't call it a house of evangelism or of prophecy or of healing or of ministry. Now, all of those things are amazing and important and things that I want us all to give our attention to. But when the Lord God establishes his people, the church, me and you, Solid Ground Church, West Point Church, he says over us, our house, my house, will be called a house of prayer. And so one of, or least, you know, the defining factor of our collectiveness as the people of God should be prayer. You see, oftentimes people from the outside of churches 
when they look in, more often than not what they see is strategy and branding and techniques and events. What they should see is a collective group of people committed to prayer. See, for many of us, we have found ourselves guilty of thinking that prayer and prayer ministry in the church is reserved for a few old ladies who sit at the back of the church and pray midweek, you know, quietly by themselves. But prayer needs to become a daily reality for every single one of us. Every single believer in the body of Christ needs to have a daily reality of encountering Jesus in prayer. We need an awakening to the fact that simply opening our mouths and uttering phrases towards heaven is the primary means of us encountering Jesus and building a relationship with him. Because at the heart of prayer is the revelation of our nearness to God. And nearness has been the deepest desire of the Father right from the very beginning. In the book, if you've read the Bible, the book, the, the Song of Songs, if you've read that book, it's quite a, quite a crazy book, actually. Um, you know, quite erotic in many ways. But um, there, it's, it's actually, what it actually is, is it's a, a prophecy of Jesus' intimacy and relationship with the church. And, and we read this. He wants to see our face and hear our voice in chapter 2. The most intimate beautiful, poetic book in the Bible, describing Jesus' relationship with you and me, we read, he wants to see our face and hear our voice. We see this in the garden. God wants to be near. In the tabernacle, in the temple, in the incarnation of Christ, when the Spirit of God is sent to indwell in our hearts, when Jesus is going to come again for his second coming, it's all about God wanting to pursue us and be near to us. He wants to be with us. He's not a distant God that sits in the sky and like waits for us to do stuff for him and then speak to him and like because we have to. He's so desirous to be in our presence and he knows that, that we're going to find peace and joy and life and purpose and meaning when we come into his presence. He said his ear is open. He wants to be with his people. He wants to be near to us. And now because of the reality of the finished work of Christ, there is a veil of separation between us and God, which we call sin. And that has been completely destroyed. And Christ has won over for us nearness to God by his death and resurrection and ascension. And we are now invited to draw near to God. We can stand in his presence. Friends, you can stand in the presence of God. This is not about... Sunday church and midweek this or this event. It's I can stand in the presence of God, creator of the universe. He wants to know me. His ear is directed towards me. I can talk to him. I can ask him for things. And then I can go off as a participant in his kingdom advancement and, and minister to other people from this place of intimacy and nearness to the Lord. So as we draw near to him, what actually starts happening is we stop evaluating ourselves and our own identity, identity based on the things that we do for God, and we begin to live out of an overflow of our nearness to him and our desire to be with him. Just like Shelby would destroy anything and everything to get to Judah, we need to have the zeal and passion to want to enter into the place of intimacy and nearness with our Father. The theologian A.W. Tozer says this, he says, There is no greater hindrance to a life of prayer than wrong thoughts about God. If you think, and if prayer is difficult, and prayer is hard, and we need to get better at it, but the greatest hindrance, I, I agree with, with Tozer here, me and my mate Tozer, uh, is that the, the greatest hindrance to a, a powerful, meaningful prayer life is wrong thoughts about God. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and evaluate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. Right thinking about God, we need to reevaluate how we see the Lord. I believe that there is so little prayer because our view of God is actually so small. Our God is glorious, He is beautiful, He is good, and He cannot be improved upon. And yet so many of us 
are, are, con- are, are not connected to this reality. We have a low view of God, and our low view of God, it will, the first place it's going to manifest itself is in our prayer life. Just like Israel, we fail to recognize that he is a great king who is worthy of all of our energy and our time, our efforts, and our worship. This is why developing a a strong, a faithful, a powerful, and sustainable life of prayer has to begin by changing our thoughts of who God is. In Luke chapter 11, after spending many years with Jesus, the disciples, they've witnessed miracles, they've witnessed healings, they've witnessed Jesus casting out demons, and the one thing that they asked Jesus to do is to teach us to pray. They concluded that all of Jesus' power, all of his life, and all of his authority was first and foremost found in the place of prayer. They're like, that stuff's good. We, you, you can teach us to preach later. Teach us to pray. Because if we know how to pray, then all of this other stuff will come. The Father will be with us. And so the disciples, they come to him and they say, teach us to pray. And the first thing that Jesus does, interestingly, is not give them like a five-point step on like, okay, do this, kneel, face this, you know. Jesus doesn't do that. He just simply says, okay, cool, and he just starts praying. Jesus teaches them to pray by praying, and so he models for them what prayer should be like, and we call this prayer the Lord's Prayer. And so Jesus basically starts off by saying, forget about your shopping lists directed towards heaven. This is not a like, let's get God to do, we're allowed to ask, by the way, but that's not the goal of prayer. And Jesus, instead, in the very opening line of the Lord's Prayer, he highlights the importance of connecting with the person. He says, our Father. The person is the Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus places in front of the disciples by his model of prayers, connect with the Father and realize how holy and awesome and wonderful and glorious this Father is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The source and the foundation of all of our faith and our intimacy and our encounter in the reality of prayer is found in a true revelation that God is our Father. Sadly, most of the body of Christ has been impacted more by the father of lies, which is Satan. Uh, And Satan comes to constantly bombard us with doubts and accusations against our heavenly father. Because the enemy knows that if he can sow little seeds of unbelief into our hearts and into our minds about who God is and and his status as father over our lives, uh, he 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 knows that we will then not really want to pray. You see, because if I view God as Father, I want to pray. I want to get into His presence. He loves me. I'm secure there. I know that my kids are secure in my presence. And so they want to be with me. But if they felt unsafe or unsure or didn't really think that I could connect with them or protect them or love them, they wouldn't want to be near me, you know, as much as they do. And so the enemy knows how to derail a Christian is to place wrong thoughts about God in his or her own heart and mind so that we don't want to pray. That's the number one tactic. Many of us view God as a middle-class working dad who has seven billion children, and we just one of the voices that are directed there, and he has to deal with us, and maybe, you know, he's listening. Others of us view God through a lens of our own earthly, our relationship with our own earthly fathers, maybe a dad who was emotionally absent or physically absent uh, or unwilling or just unable to meet our needs. And so we place these Without even realizing it, we place these attributes onto God as Father, and we relate to God in a warped, dysfunctional way. Because in both cases, we allow broken, fallen man and their enemy, the the, the father of lies, to form our belief of who God is as our Heavenly Father. And the only way to break free from this unbelief and to feed ourselves on the knowledge, is to to feed ourselves on the knowledge of God, the truths concerning who He is and, and, and who we are to Him. Because, friends, the Bible is filled from start to finish uh, uh, with this revelation of who God is. Let me tell you who He is. He is merciful. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's faithful. He's compassionate. He's jealous. He's an all-consuming fire. He is love. Like, He's not just loving, because that's an action. God is love itself. He, he, he is uh, rich to all who call upon him, not just in provision, but also in generosity. He's overflowing in abundance towards those who call out to him. He is kind. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He's present everywhere. He's with us right now. He's eternal. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. 
He is meek and humble and just and righteous and holy and indescribable. He's above and beyond. He's the greatest gift you will ever receive. He loves you. He pursues you. He's for you. He's everything you can ever imagine. We actually cannot describe him. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is our father. And our father, the creator of heaven and earth and all things, who has the desire to give us every good gift in Christ. This is the God that comes near, puts his ear towards us and says, have a relationship with me. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, where did God begin? Genesis 1 states, in the beginning, God was there. Have you ever considered that God himself is just uncreated? Like I said, we, we, we can't even comprehend that thought. Everything else in all of existence, from the smallest atomic structure to the grandest angelic being, is created. But God is in a completely other class. He's uncreated. He has no beginning. He's eternally powerful and eternally wise. This is our Father. I know you have, some of you have been doing a study through the book of Revelation midweek. I love the book of Revelation. In Revelation 4, the apostle John He's on an island and he's supernaturally transported by the Spirit into heaven. And he gets a, a visual of what heaven's like. And, 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 and then he gets to come and describe heaven to us. And it's kind of strange language and really confusing. And it's really important to kind of work through these metaphors. But the first thing that John sees when he enters into this, this heaven by the Spirit, he, he describes the scene that's set before him. And he describes the one who is seated on a throne. Now, when you read Revelation, as I said, it's kind of strange language, and uh, it's kind of hard to interpret. But if you would read it in this way, if you imagine what it's like trying to explain an object or an experience to somebody that has never encountered that experience or object before in their life. And so what you do is you take something that would be familiar to that person, and you use that as an analogy or as a metaphor to describe the experience or the object that you are trying to describe, right? So that's what John's doing here. He's taking everyday normal objects of the first century world and he's describing to them what is actually indescribable. And John writes this. He says, the one on the throne is like jasper stone and sardis stone. Now, in the first century world, jasper stone is the ancient equivalent of a diamond. And, and a sardis stone is like bright red. And so what John is saying, when I mean, he, he's, he's trying to describe the scene of the one on the throne, he, he's saying, this, this being on the throne, the, our God, is, is precious. He's beautiful. He's invaluable. He's like a diamond, bright and just exquisite in its beauty. But, but he's also fire. He's also powerful. He's also mighty. So it's this, this tension between this, this God is beautiful and indescribable. And, and I, I just want to I want him, I want my, but he's also, he's fierce and I, I tremble in his presence. He's describing the greatness of our father. And then he says there's a rainbow of emeralds around the throne. There's this, this powerful light just radiating around the king. And, and then he says that these, these gemstones, they, they're beautiful in the natural. He's, he's, he's saying hey, these things are amazing, but our God is indescribable. Anything you can picture of this red fiery diamond and rainbows are erupting around the throne like that's not even the start. I can't even, I don't have words to describe this, this God of ours. And he says his beauty is the completion of all of his perfections. Our God is perfect in every possible way. It's a product of his very being, his perfection. Perfection, absolute perfection. God is a blinding light. He's holiness. Uh, he is an all-consuming fire. He is consumed with jealousy towards us. He, is, he overflows with covenantal mercy and grace and love towards his children. He's beautiful and burning and merciful. And his mercy is clearly demonstrated as John describes the scene, this throne room scene. There's 24 elders. These 24 elders are also seated on thrones. And they're wearing garments, uh, they're the robes, uh, these beautiful robes, and they've got crowns on their heads. And, and this is us. He's, he's saying, hey, God does not give you and me what we deserve. He actually invites us into this glorious throne room and then puts us on a throne. And then he puts his righteousness, his robe of righteousness over us. And then he rewards us, not based on anything we have done, but because of the finished work of Christ, we get a crown on our head. And we enter into this, this throne room with God. Friends, when we are reawakened to the revelation of our place before God, 
I believe that prayer, talking to him, and an encounter with Jesus will actually erupt across the earth. I honestly believe that prayer is so few, we pray so little, because the view of God in the Christian church is so small. How do you view God? The book of Revelation does not describe the glory and the, the greatness of the Father alone. Immediately in the first chapter, in the opening uh, pages of this book, this wonderful book, we read a description of Jesus that reveals the divine glory of the Son. So in Revelation 1, before we even get to this throne room scene of God and wonder and glory, John hears a voice, a voice like the sound of a trumpet. And when he, when he turns to see where this voice is coming from, what's the source of this voice? He beholds a man, a man standing among seven lampstands, and his hair is white. And this is describing Jesus. His white hair describes his wisdom. His garments represent his calling as the intercessor, the, the high priest, the king of the, of the world, our king. His eyes are like fire fire, which represents zeal and jealousy and love towards us. He has bronze feet, and these bronze feet represent how much, he, how much zeal he has to, towards uh, uh, unrighteousness, that he, just, he wants righteousness across the earth. He has a voice like powerful waters, and it describes his creative power and how mighty he is. He has a sword. Imagine there's a sword coming out of his mouth, and that describes the, the power and the strength of the Word of God. And in his hands, he's holding the stars. He's holding the stars in his hands and, and he nurtures and fulfills all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. John is so overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory of this man that he falls at his feet as one that is dead. Friends, we are not supposed to know Jesus as somebody who we can come to in prayer who can meet our needs. We need to come to Jesus as someone who is the beautiful God who overwhelms our hearts and then we just fall at his feet because there's no other response. Do you know Jesus? Do you, I mean, let, let this, let's clap, friends. This is the God that we serve, the beauty and the wonder of Christ. When, when, when we come into his presence, the only fitting response is I am overwhelmed by his goodness and his glory that I fall at his feet as one that is dead. Too many of us come to Christ as just someone that can meet our needs when we need him. We need a revelation of who Jesus is, friends. And then we will want to have an encounter with him. Our prayer lives will not be fueled by duty, or obligation. I get the privilege of encountering this heavenly being, our God, creator of heaven and earth, who is all powerful. I can go on. He's seated on a throne, but yet he chooses to pursue us in love. So the most important question for all of us is who do you say I am? Jesus asks this question to the disciples. He says, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Jesus comes to the disciples and he asks them this question 2,000 years ago and I believe that he is asking all of us, whether you're not a Christian or you've been a Christian for 30, 40 years, it's important to realign our hearts and our minds around Christ. Who do you say he is? In Matthew chapter 16, we read this confession of Peter. In verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do, you, sorry, who do people say the Son of Man is? So Jesus comes, he's like, hey guys, who, what, what's everyone else saying about me? What's, everyone, what, what's the vibe out there? What's everyone's, who do they say I am? And so the disciples reply, they say, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus is like, cool. But who do you, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answers them, he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. See, many believers in the Christian church are content to listen to what other people say about Jesus. We, we are content to listen and believe what other people say Jesus is. But what other people say about God should merely just be a catalyst of our own personal journey of faith and discovery. This is why Jesus says to the disciples, okay, what other people, what are the other people saying about me? 
He, he wanted the disciples to recognize, okay, other people have an opinion. Other people have a viewpoint on who Jesus is. That's great. Okay, figure that out. But that's not enough. You, you cannot base your life and your faith upon the revelation of another man or another woman. You need to have an encounter with Jesus yourself. You, he, he, Jesus is basically saying, uh, you know, th- this is personal revelation. He's saying, are you living your life through the words and the revelation of another man or a woman? Or have you truly grappled with your own beliefs? Have you come to your own conclusions? Do you possess, friends, solid ground church, do we possess our own revelation of who God is? Who is Jesus to you? Because Jesus asked them a second question. He says, who do you say I am? And Simon responds immediately with a confession. He says, you are the Christ. Clear as day. You are the Christ, son of the living God. Now, friends, this statement from Simon is more shocking than God using Balaam's donkey to go and carry a message. Simon, he's a fisherman. He has no education, even less wisdom. And, and, and yet he, uh, he has realized the revelation of who this man is. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus declares, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, Simon, you did not hear this at the Who Do You Say I Am conference. You did not hear this from another man or another woman or a special event. My father's revealed this to you. Simon got into the presence of Jesus, had an encounter with him, and he was able to recognize who this man is. Jesus is saying, hey, my father revealed this to you. Friends, it does not matter how many teachings you hear, how many, how many anointed preachers come through town. It does not matter how many books you've read or how many Bible verses you can quote. Only the Father can reveal the Son to you, and you get to the Father through the Son in the place of prayer. Jesus goes on to say in, in verse 17, he responds to Simon's confession. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter, changes his name. And on this rock, on the rock that you have a revelation of the, of the son, that he's the Messiah, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not overpower. Notice that when Simon reveals this revelation of who Jesus is, Jesus turns the tables on him. Jesus is like, okay, cool. Now that you know who I am, I can tell you who you are. Do you see how powerful prayer is, friends? We get into the presence of the Father. He reveals the Son to us. And then the Son can say, this is who you are. And Jesus says, you're no longer Simon, but you're Peter. Jesus goes on to draw Simon into his prophetic destiny. The plans and purposes of God over Simon's life are, are released and spoken over him. Simon becomes the great like, pastor in church history. Many believers in the church today are so obsessed with finding my identity. Trying to, so obsessed with finding, like, what's my purpose? What's my meaning? What's my special role in life? We try so many things. Five-step plans to happiness and all sorts of stuff to find out who I am. But only those who find the Son and truly understand who He is will be able to understand who they are and who they are created to be. So, who do you think you are? The revelation of who he is and the revelation of who we are to him, those are the pillars on which confidence and authority and power and encounter in prayer rests. You want an encounter with Jesus in prayer? Who do you say he is? Let him tell you who you are. Everything will change. We cannot separate the quest from our own personal identity and our own knowledge of God. We cannot separate the two. Many believers experience identity crises, and I believe the reason is because they're trying to find themselves in everything and anything other than God. But Peter discovered if you know who he is, then he's going to tell you who you are. Because one of the great truths, friends, that's, that's given to us at the cross, that's revealed to us at the cross of Christ, it's just how much God loves us. I ask this question again. Do you know how much God loves you? And that He loves you first. 
He loves you so much, then rather than lose you, he takes on your form, he lives your life, he dies your death, and he places his very spirit inside of you because he wants to be near you. Not just like he wants to come and go over for a bra, he actually indwells in your heart. That's how much he wants to be near you. He's with us forever. He loves you so much that he takes on your form, lives your life, dies your death, places his spirit inside of you. The cross of Christ is the ultimate declaration that God loves you, friends. Can you just say out loud like God loves me? Say God chooses me. God delights in me. Friends, God is he, he's here. He wants to be with you. When a third of the angels rebel and they get cast out of heaven, does God chase after them? The answer is no. But the ones who he formed in his own image, when we rebel against him, he sends his very son as the ultimate declaration of vulnerability and infinite love towards us, that he is a pursuing God. He wants to be with you. Not only are we forgiven and accepted, but we have been invited into an encounter with Jesus, friends, and that's what this series is about. We can go through the rhythms of Christian life and Christian activity, or we can have an encounter with Jesus. I know what I want. Because it's all about union with him. Jesus went to the cross for this purpose. He wanted to, to, for us to be with him and for us to see his glory, for us to have an encounter. Our words towards him, our, our prayer lives, none of it will matter if our hearts are disconnected from who he is. If our loves are disordered in our lives. Intimacy, relationship with the Father, that's the beginning of prayer. I could have come today and given you a five-point thing on prayer. Oh, I could just hopefully try and encourage you to see the Father and let prayer and life and encounter be birthed out of that place. Prayer is where we encounter Jesus, friends. So what do you do now? Just go home and talk to God. Just talk to Him. Heaven's ear is in your direction. He did everything possible to be with you. Our response is just to talk to Him grow in intimacy and relationship. The most practical thing that you can do going forward is to just set aside time every day, quiet in your soul and speak to God. Because we can talk about prayer, we can read about prayer, we can watch other people pray, but in the end of the day, unless we go on this journey and have a personal encounter with Jesus and get onto this thing ourselves, it's not going to happen. A, a powerful, a beautiful, a vibrant prayer life does not happen by accident or by listening to someone else preach. We've got to get in the prayer room. We've got to get into the closets. You've got to speak to the Father. Prayer happens when we make intentional, wise decisions about the rhythms and time management of our lives and we prioritize the loves of our hearts. Maybe we have to throw some, maybe you've got to throw some things off. Maybe it's words spoken over you. Maybe it's your view of Father. Maybe it's just your day is too busy. You got, maybe you've got to change some stuff. But it's worth it, friends, because you see Jesus. I want to experience what John experienced, where there's this, this uncontrollable thing of just falling down at the feet of Jesus because he has overwhelmed my heart. So if we know who he is, he will tell us who we are and our relationship, our, the reality of a faithful life will take on a whole new meaning. The source and foundation of prayer is the knowledge, friends, that God delights in you. He loves you. And the revelation that we are His beloved bride will be the foundation and the fuel of all of our prayer life. So we need to look to Jesus. We need to see Him for who He is. And then we need to cultivate a hunger and a desire to want to be in that place. And then we do everything possible we run through walls, we jump through windows, we get into his presence because he's worth it. Let's stand together. Father, we love you. We worship you, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd come and minister to our hearts now as we sing and reveal the person of Christ to us, that we would see Jesus, Lord. I pray that our lives would never be the same because we've had an encounter with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who loves us, who pursues us, 
who died for us, who rose again to life for us, who right now himself is the great intercessor, meaning he's praying for us on our behalf towards the Father. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you would send your one and only Son to put us into a place of life and freedom and peace and joy. And I pray that that would be the defining thing of your people, Lord. The one thing that sets us apart from every other people group on this planet is that we have the presence of God in our midst. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us a tangible encounter with you. Jesus, come. Let's sing. Let's worship.